Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh uh, the Jet Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Benny and the Bryant. (laughs) And Jerry's over there. Uh, And she's just Jerry. This is Stuff You Should Know. Jerry's Captain Fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Why are we talking about a piano player? uh, What about, how about Mr. Roboto? (laughs) Sure. Okay. Jerry, Mr. Roboto, Roland. (laughs) Great. So, um, how you doing, man? I think you're probably pretty jazzed about this one. You think? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Tad? (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this one as a musician and guitar nerd. Uh Uh-huh. And we we definitely want to shout out at the beginning the inspiration behind this. And a lot of the research for this came from the great book uh, called The Birth of Loud. It's not – there's not a colon on the cover, but it's implied. Okay. Should we get a different jingle for implied colon? Um, Yeah, but it should be like a down kind of thing, like burn. Okay. (laughs) The Birth of Loud, uh, Leo Fender, Les Paul, and the Guitar Pioneering Rivalry – that shaped rock and roll, and this was from Ian Port in 2019, and it is a, if you're a guitar player, just get the book. You've probably already read it, but if you hadn't, get it, because it's great. Yes. Um, Hats off to him. Hats off to Dave Roos for helping us out with this one as well, too. Totally. Dave did a great job. So, um, what we're talking— And this is a two-parter, right? Yeah, we're going to two-part it up, because it's that big. It's that important of a thing. It's really easy for people like me who— um, you know, appreciate music, but also appreciate music too. You know what I mean? Um, sure. To kind of overlook the just the the epic story behind electric guitars. It's almost like like I, I didn't think they were always there, and I knew roughly when they'd been invented, and I think I kind of knew kind of who invented it, but i I didn't realize just what a sweeping effect and impact that electrifying certain kinds of guitars had on the world like it's 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 one of like the most impactful inventions ever made oh absolutely uh and then when you look at this story and read that book especially um the gentlemen les Paul and leo fender it's a remarkable story in that they were very similar in some ways. They were very, very different in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. They they both uh, ended up with um, permanent injuries that affected their craft. Mm-hmm. Um, when one was up, another might be down a little. Um, when And this goes to the guitars as well. When the, the Fender brand was up, it seems like the Les Paul was down. When the Les Paul was up, Fender was down. And it's really they they both kind of tried to take credit for things that they didn't really invent <laughs> at times so it's it's really interesting when you look at the story of these two dudes in this era of innovation and invention and just how remarkable it was and for the people who are really unfairly left out that had maybe even more to do with it yeah because there's a lot of hands that went into the creation of the electric guitar as we understand it today. A lot of people, a lot of unsung people uh these guys just happened to be two of the ones whose whose names you know became synonymous with electric guitars. but that's also not to say like they didn't deserve to have that kind of recognition too. They really did contribute even if they did kind of like you said take credit to some extent for things they didn't necessarily do specifically. Yeah, it's one of those inventions that if you ask someone who invented the electric guitar, you have to follow that up with a lot of questions in order to answer it. Is it (laughs) the person who invented the electric guitar pickup, which made it possible to electrify something? Mm -hmm. Or is it the first person to stick that pickup on a chunk of wood instead of a big hollow guitar? Mm -hmm. Or is it the first person to actually build one that worked that you could sell to people? Um, You just can't answer that cleanly and say – this person invented the electric guitar. Like five or six people invented the electric guitar. Yeah, and if you're just a normal, like non, you know, guitar person, you probably regretted asking that question. <laughs> now you just say, "Is that freedom rock?" <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, that ran through my head <laughs> more than once for sure. Turn it up. So, um, I guess we should get started um, with. You want to start with Leo Fender? Yeah. 
So, um, Clarence Leonidas Fender. <laughs> Webster's defines Fender as <laughs> Clarence <name>. Leonidas Fender. <laughs> He does have a good name, and he's one of these guys. You said that he and Les Paul, who we'll meet in a little while, were very different. And um, Leo Fender wasn't just different from Les Paul. He was different from a lot of people. He was a, what you would call an engineer. And if you have a parent who is an engineer or a friend who's an <laughs> I thought engineer. thought about your dad. <laughs> or you're an engineer. You know that engineers are different kind of a different, they're cut from a different cloth. And, and Leo Fender was definitely an engineer from what I can tell. Yeah, I totally thought about your dad during this. Um, okay. Leo was born on August 10th, 1909 in Orange County, California. And his first injury that affected his craft was his eye. When he was um, between seven and eight, he lost an eye uh, when he fell off his dad's vegetable truck and had a glass eye from there on out. Um, you know, it's it's not like losing an ear, which we'll get to that later. Um, if you're an engineer who works in generally in sound, mm -hmm. but when you're working on small circuit boards and stuff like that, losing one eye is certainly going to affect your work. Well, plus also he apparently was self-conscious about it, which is just, just that tugs too. at my heart. Can you imagine a little, little eight year old yeah. Leo Fender who's like, you know, can't look up. He's looking down at the ground all the time while he's talking to you because he's self-conscious about his glass eye. That is just heartbreaking. Yeah, and like you said, he was an engineer, little electrical circuit board nerd. Uh, he would take things apart and put them back together from an early age. He uh, There's a great story from the book when he was about 10 years old. Uh, he got underneath uh, the, the car and the driveway and basically took a look at it, what was going on, mm -hmm. went inside and sketched out – uh, not only just what it exactly looked like, but how it all and could explain how it all worked together to make that car move. Yeah, which is astounding. That's like prodigy kind of stuff. Like he was an engineering prodigy is another way to put that. Because Absolutely. Not, you know, even even among engineers, that's pretty remarkable. And especially as a kid to do it, too. Um, and then what makes him even more remarkable as an engineer and for all the things that he accomplished, he, he never had any formal training as an engineer. He just kind of became one just by be doing things that engineers do. It was like taking things apart, putting them back together, inventing new stuff, improving things that he thought could be improved. He just kind of learned by doing, which is, you know, that's that's old school. Very old school. Get yeah. in there and tinker away, right? Yeah, but... If you don't have overalls on, what are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> now, was your dad always tinkering with things in the house, too? No, he was more like, um, I've had to like make drawings all day at work. Leave me alone. Maybe bring gotcha. me an old Milwaukee tall boy <laughs> before you leave. Okay. But if there was anything that went wrong in the house, you know, uh -huh. my mom would be like, can you fix that? Can you fix gotcha. this? And he could fix it all. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I can fix nothing. Yeah. He was I'm too busy. Like um, He was too busy leading um, Cub Scout meetings that I was not a part of any longer right. to, to tinker. He was too busy. Well, it sounds like you guys found a great way to not spend time together. <laughs> we did. Well, I would bring him beer. That's how I got to spend time. Right. Uh, so Leo was really fascinated with radios early on as a child. Uh, he would build his own. He got a broadcast license when he was in high school. And before you know it, he had kids and neighbors, adults even, that would come over to have him fix their radios mm -hmm. and to the point where he had a little repair shop in there in Fulton, uh, California, where the big fender factory ended up being. Yeah, I guess it started out at that radio as the radio repair shop and just kind of grew from there, right? Yeah, as a radio shack. Isn't that cool? <laughs> a literal radio shack. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think that the good people at Radio Shack would have had a problem with it had you called it that. <laughs> But it Probably was so. that. You could have made a case like, no, no, Radio Shack is the ripoff. This is the Radio Shack. And the judge would have been like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Capital T. You're all going to jail. Um, so he was building radios. He started working on PA systems, public address systems, uh, which if you don't know what that is. It's always people get, are getting on me now for saying, like, everyone knows what that is. It's what the principal talked on. Yeah, or anytime you have a microphone attached to speakers, that's a public address system. Yeah, that's funny because it has been a little while since since somebody called you out on that because you stopped saying if you've been living under a rock. But now, Chuck, they're they're <laughs> they're meeting you wherever you're at as far as that's, that's right. concerned. I think I'm trying you to just do better. you either have to completely stop or just give up caring. One of the two. <laughs> well, I explained what a PA system was, so maybe I'm on the right track. I think you did great with that. 
So this is when he started to become obsessed with uh, what we're just going to call the big challenge, which was basically, you have to think back to a time where music was not electrified. Uh, they were singing through microphones. The They did have um, lap steel guitars were electrified. That was technically the first electric guitar was the lap steel. Yeah, the Rickenbacker frying pan I saw. Yeah, that was kind of the very first thing. And in fact, the uh, the guy who started Rickenbacker, uh, George Beauchamp, he was the inventor of the electric pickup. Yes. So, so you got to thank him big time for kind of leading the way. Yeah, he he basically, uh, he he yeah, he laid the foundation that who knows how long it would have taken. But I, I just want to like explain to people who are like me who don't understand this kind of stuff just real quick what a pickup is. Sure. Yeah, the, yeah. The pickup is the heart of what makes the electric guitar electric. And it basically works through um, electromagnetism, where you loop a bunch of like copper wire around some magnets. And then when you move the strings above those magnets, it actually affects that magnetic field and produces an electrical signal. That electrical signal goes from the pickup through the cord to the PA where it's amplified, and now you have an electric guitar. And that's the guy who came up with this astoundingly impressive invention. Because not only did it work, he figured out how to make it pretty small right out of the gate. Like the frying pan um, electric lap steel guitar is ugly, but it was small and compact. It wasn't like those early computers that took up an entire room. He like figured out how to make it, you know, useful right out of the gate. It was a big, big innovation from what I can tell. Yeah, and another way to think of, uh, if you know nothing about guitars, of the pickup is it's like the microphone for the guitar. Right. Uh, and you, when you're when someone is playing a guitar, it's that little horizontal, uh, usually sort of, uh, not oval, but it's square and then rounded. Uh, I don't know what that shape is. What's that called? Ellipsoid? <laughs> is that real? Yeah, it's like an I mean, ellipse. is that what, what it really is? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right. So I mean, it's I'm an ellip- guessing here. <laughs> it's the little ellipsoid underneath the strings. Uh, sometimes they're covered up. Uh, sometimes they're left open. Like on Fender guitars, they're left open. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something called a humbucker pickup, which uh, Fenders have a tremendous amount of hum and buzz when you plug them in mm-hmm. because it's only one magnet. Humbuckers had two sets of magnets that canceled the hum out mm-hmm. from each other. Yeah. And those are usually, uh, but not always, covered up with a little steel plate. Right, so humbuckers just two pickups, so that they, like you said, they cancel out the the electrical noise from the other equipment that it picks up, right? Yes, and that's what I prefer. Sure. Although I do have a Rickenbacker, I prefer and have quite a few Gibsons. So um, when we say like the electric guitar, you just hit upon something when we were talking about the frying pan. The frying pan was the world's first electric guitar. It was from 1931. It had uh, pickups. Um, It had amplified sound, but it was a lap steel guitar. Um, So very shortly after that, we had what other people would call the world's first electric guitar. This is where that answer where you're like, well, who invented the electric guitar comes from? Because what a lot of people would recognize as an electric guitar came after. And it was from Gibson, I think, in 1936, where it looked like you know, a normal guitar, but it was electrified, like um, the classic acoustic guitar, but an electrified version. And you'd say, well, why doesn't that qualify as the first electric guitar? Because it doesn't. For our purposes for this episode, that's still not the first electric guitars we're talking about. What we're talking about is, as we'll see, what's known as the first solid body electric guitar. That's what we're really driving at. So if you're sitting there, you know, and you're um, just crumpling your your issue of Guitarist (laughs) Magazine right now and losing your mind, settle down because I just spelled it out for everybody, okay? Yeah, and so getting back to where we kind of got off track in a good way, but getting back to the big burning question and the big problem was with these, they called them Spanish guitars, but we call them acoustic guitars now, that had those electric pickups in them they were really prone to feedback because they had this big hollow cavity behind the hole or it, you know, it usually had what's called F holes. And that sounds funny, but if you look at them, they're just shaped <laughs> like an ornate sort of cursive F. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> so the, uh, because of these big hollow acoustic guitars with these pickups, 
and early amp technology, they would just feed back like crazy anytime you tried to get any volume. So Yeah, those pickups wouldn't differentiate between the, the um, vibrations from the string that you were intended or the reverberated vibrations from inside the hollow body of the, that Spanish-style guitar. And so it just sounded awful. Right. So that was the thing that Leo Fender was obsessed with. He was like, how could, because, you know, it, it's hard to imagine, but at the time, the guitar was not a lead instrument. And it mm -hmm. was, there were occasional like guitar solos and stuff that you could uh, insert into a recording or, you know, they recorded lives, but you could put on a recording. But like if you were playing live in a, in a venue, the guitar was very much in the background because you couldn't turn it up loud enough to cut through the vocals and the drums, the piano, the horn sections. These were all really loud live instruments. And he was like, Leo Fender was like, we've got to be able to amplify this sound such that it doesn't feed back to where you can actually hear the guitar in a concert hall. Yeah, so like it can stand on its own rather than accompany, you know, whoever the horns or get drowned out. Like that was the point of like Fender and later on Les Paul's quest is to make the guitar its own thing and to basically do that by making it really loud and sound really good when it is loud. Oh man, this is getting good. This is a good time for a break, I think, right? I think so too, man. All right, I'm going to go take a cold shower, and I'll be right back. Right, Chuck. So we're back. So Leo Fender's on this quest. He's figured out there's a big problem here that if you want to make a guitar loud, you have to make it not an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. But he he one of the things about him was he wasn't a musician. Like he didn't clamp onto this this problem of creating the electric guitar, figuring out how to make an electric guitar because he necessarily cared about the music. And he also later on he, um, it turns out he didn't like rock and roll which would be kind of ironic. He was a country <laughs> western dude from Southern California, kind of like Nicolas Cage's character in Valley Girl. <laughs> exactly, Valley Girl. <laughs> that was him, that's basically. Good. It was based on Leo Fender. That's my, that's my theory. Uh, yeah, so Fender didn't play, but here's something that was very cute, that uh, story from the book. He would go to local music halls uh, during live performances with his, he always had this little tool kit on him, <laughs> I think much like your dad's slide rule. Mm-hmm. And he would jump up on stage and tweak the amps during the middle of performances. And people there would be like, what is this guy doing? Mm -hmm. and, and the band sometimes would say, hey, everybody, this is Leo Fender. He's the one that makes it sound just right. And uh, he would, like, during, <laughs> during the show, would kind of mess, get his screwdriver out and mess with the amps. That's pretty cute. It's very cool. Uh, yeah, he'd be like, oh, you want me to turn it up, man? I'll turn it up for you, you dirty <laughs> hippie. All right, should we go to Mr. Les Paul? Yeah, so um, Fender, we should just just recap real quick. Fender has has stumbled upon the big problem with electric guitars, the reverb with a classical guitar. So he's thinking about that. And now we meet Chuck Les Paul, who was born Lester Paulfus in 1915 in Waukesha, Wisconsin. He was That's a Wisconsin right. boy, like Ed Gein was as well, but not nearly as grisly. <laughs> no, but a guitar wizard like Ed Gein. <laughs> right. <laughs> Little known fact about Ed Gein. Yeah, so before we get into his childhood, this is the real important distinction between Leo Fender and Les Paul. Leo Fender did not play instruments, was an engineer at heart, and loved to figure out problems for other people. Les Paul was, uh, at, at the height of his game, the, the most popular guitar player in the world, and with a string of number one hits. Uh, he was also a tinkerer, but he was like, I need to make my guitar sound better for me so I can get better and sound better. Yeah, that was his goal all along. But, you know, it takes a special kind of person to say like, okay, well, then I need to figure out how to make that happen. I need to figure out how to make an electric guitar rather than, oh, what can I do? I need to. I need somebody to do this for me. Someone needs to invent this or I need to collaborate with somebody. He was like, I'm, I'm going to go try to figure this out myself. And he really, like, I didn't realize what a guitar god he was and that he, he was like this, um, I think at one point he had like four hits 
or four um, spots on the Billboard top charts. Um, yeah. Like he was really a popular musician um, about midway through his career. But even from a young age, he started out playing like he was a performer. And I think he's also credited Chuck with being the person because um, he played country western too. He also played the harmonica. Uh, his act was called Rhubarb Red, and it was mm-hmm. just him. And he played the guitar and the harmonica. And he figured out long before Bob Dylan ever came along that that's problematic. You technically need four arms for that. So he fashioned a harmonica holder that he could wear while he was playing the guitar, just like Bob Dylan wore later on. He was the kid who invented that years before. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> this is another one of those things where it's like, did he invent it or did he see it and make one on his own? Mm-hmm. But not taking anything away from the guy. He was also a kid taking apart electronics in his house, putting them back together. He really knew what he was doing. And he also had, you know, like every guitar player, that same big problem was when he played, he would be up there and he could sing uh, through that microphone, although he didn't sing that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did when he was a kid, but later on he he realized he was not like a pro singer. Uh, harmonica sounded good through the mic, but that guitar was still in the background, and he knew that was an issue. Yeah, so apparently, um, as this as legend has it, he was playing a, a show at a barbecue stand, um, and I think it was a regular, p- potentially a regular show. He he could his harmonica sounded fine when he was singing; it was broadcast fine because he had a microphone. But nothing was working for the uh, guitar. It was, he was drowning it out himself. So he realized that if he took the phonograph needle, the electrified phonograph needle from his his um, parents' phonograph, and attach it to the guitar, and then attach that to a radio, he could actually amplify his guitar. So he figured this out, I think, at like age 13, um, because he wanted to improve his barbecue stand chops. And tips. And tips. Supposedly his tips tripled as a result. But, um, you know, that's pretty impressive stuff. I would not have thought about that at the as at the tender young age of 13 or 45. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's where the tinkering comes in. And I'm sure it didn't sound great to our ears now. But at the time, you have to put yourself in the place of, like, literally having never heard something like this happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it had to have been like a revelation to actually hear that guitar coming through a speaker. Especially if you lived in Waukesha, Wisconsin. You've never heard right. anything <laughs> like that in your life. Uh, but he was very much opposite of Leo Fender in his personality. He was very gregarious, very outgoing, made a lot of friends, uh, could also be a little brash, was not a great husband uh, to his two wives, which we'll get to. But he was... Uh, he was always sort of the life of the party, and he loved performing in front of people, whereas Leo Fender really kind of wanted to be at the background unless he was very quietly getting on stage. Um, and Les Paul, from the very beginning, uh, once he could afford regular guitars, I think he moved to Chicago and was like making decent money, uh, like backing other people up. But he had a relationship with Gibson from the very beginning because Gibson started out as – an acoustic guitar maker, uh, and they're still known. I mean, they make these great electric guitars, but, you know, some of the best guitars in the world are Gibson acoustic guitars. Yeah, they also uh, made, like, mandolins and, like, um, yeah. like uh, just all manner of stringed in- instruments, and the, what they made were basically works of art. Yeah, they were beautiful, and they still are. My favorite guitar I own is one I bought during the pandemic. I finally bought a Gibson acoustic uh, based on an, a 1940s model, and it's just... It's amazing. The sound difference between even that and my really nice Martin acoustic is striking. Really? Uh, yeah, Gibbs or Fender was not making acoustic guitars, and they still to this day don't make a very good acoustic guitar. Yeah, I can imagine. It's really interesting that like one of the biggest guitar companies in the world, I don't know if they can't or if they just don't put the resources toward it, but I think their nicest acoustic guitar tops out at about 800 bucks, which is... You know, you can get a pretty good guitar for that, but these really, really nice Gibsons are like four and $5,000. Yeah, and like Gibson's whole uh, jam was to make professional quality instruments that were, again, works of art. But like if you were a professional musician, like Gibson could make a an instrument that you could use and, and probably love. Um, and they were making them already. They were making those electrified Spanish style or electrified acoustic guitars. As as Like I was saying, as, as early as I think 1936 was the... ES-150. ES yeah. stood for Electrified Spanish Guitar. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a, a jazz guitarist named uh, Charlie Christian who really kind of championed that development. He I think he played for Benny Goodman's band. Um, but um, I think they named the pickup in those after him, Charlie Christian pickups. But um, so Les Paul was playing these Gibson guitars, but it still wasn't what he was looking for. Because again, if you turned it up really loud, it, you, it would provide all sorts of problems. Yeah, it's funny, these little letters that like the ES-335 is just a classic, amazing instrument still today. And they have all these cool letters and you never know what they name, but mm-hmm. they mean, but <laughs> electrified Spanish is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. The, the iconic Gibson SG, SG stands for solid guitar. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they're all just these very mundane abbreviations yeah. that all these years later just seem cool because Angus Young plays it. Yeah, right. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, no, if, no, it, you hate you, ACDC, yeah, right? if you used a different example from Angus Young, I'd be really on board. But I got you. <laughs> oh, man. I know what you're doing. Uh, I play one. Well, there you go. All right. As a cool <laughs> axe. Uh, so he charmed his way into the Epiphone factory in New York. Uh, Epiphone was a really big guitar maker at the time. And I think Gibson eventually bought them. Uh, I think they're uh, co brand or, you know, under the Gibson umbrella now. Mm-hmm. But uh, he got to work on his problems. And you've got to look up some pictures of some of this stuff kind of starting now. Yeah. Uh, just look up a picture of the log from Les Paul. And it was a, I was about to say essentially, but it's not essentially. It was a four by four block of uh, pine wood mm-hmm. about two feet long mm-hmm. that he put a guitar neck on, uh, an Epiphone guitar neck. And he made his own pickup. I guess he didn't go out and buy a pickup or use one from another guitar. Mm-hmm. And he made his own pickup, you know, with a magnet and a wire, put some strings on it, and called it the log. And it was a very primitive but working solid body electric guitar. It looked very much like something Devo would have played. (laughs) Yeah, and in fact, it freaked people out so much early on um, that he ended up taking apart another guitar and gluing sides onto the side of it. (laughs) Yeah, to make it look normal. To make it look normal. And there, there's this great picture of him holding the log, kind of separating the sides off mm-hmm. with a little wry smile. Um, but the Gibson, little side note, Gib- the Gibson Firebird guitar, which is one of my favorite guitars. I used to have one, but I sold it. It is a, it's called a through neck guitar. I'm sure there are others, but it's the only one I can think of that's really popular. Whereas it's the same thing. It's basically one long piece of wood, mm-hmm. like the neck is the same piece of wood as the body, and then they glue on these wings on the outside. Okay, all right, settle down, Chuck. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> so, Chuck, also, if you ever found yourself trapped in Waukesha, Wisconsin, you go uh-huh. to go to the Waukesha County Museum, and they actually have the original log there on display. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently they have a lot of Les Paul stuff there, including that, with the wings of the of the um, guitar kind of pulled away to kind of show. You know, it's a neck-through design like the Firebird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was just teasing you. I said to settle down. I was just taking an opportunity. Like, I'm, I'm charmed very much, as I'm sure everyone else is, by your childlike excitement over this whole thing. I'm as excited as when I got my first guitar when I was 12, which was a Candy Apple Red BC Rich, like metal guitar. I wish I knew what mine was. I had a metal guitar, too. Mine was pink, had a light coating of diamond dust. And I wish to wow. God I could remember the How name just of the this band. Out? Who, it was a local metal band from Toledo. What? Yeah, oh, yeah. They had, like, an album and a poster and everything. And the guy, the guitarist from the band worked at, like, the, the music store um, where I uh, would take lessons, and he taught me. And he was as interested as, um, oh, I can't remember Carl Weathers' character in Happy Gilmore, but he's like a <laughs> golf pro and just <laughs> yeah, totally yeah. uninterested. That's uh-huh. how interested this guitar player was in seeing me as a future guitar player. Um, <laughs> and it's not like I blame him for me losing interest in guitar, but he definitely didn't. He wasn't a great mentor or anything. But I wish so funny. bad. I would have stuck with it a little bit longer because it was pretty pretty boss when I look back on the whole thing. I never knew this. How long did you try? Uh, I don't know. Five, six lessons maybe. All right. I wonder well, what happened to that guitar too. Like my parents bought the guitar. I mean, it was used and everything, but like I, I have no idea what became of that guitar. I never uh, took lessons, so maybe that's the key. Yeah, I could totally see that. I just shut myself in my room and and started buying tablature 
uh, which if you don't know what that is, instead of actual sheet music, like written out like a, you know, like real sheet music, tablature or little numbers on, uh, they kind of mimic a six string guitar mm-hmm. and they put little numbers on the strings on where you should put your fingers. So it allows anyone who can't read music to sort of figure out songs. Right. Like E, E, G, E, E, <laughs> E, G. Uh, what are those chords? Someone's going to call you out on that. I don't know, but that, that was a Kids in the Hall reference more than even a Deep Purple <laughs> reference. Oh, man. I love that band in the in the skits. Uh-huh, the, the little kid garage band. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> uh, all right. So back to the log. Uh, the log was very rough, um, very primitive, but what it did accomplish was amplification without feedback no it and, was a, and longer sustain yeah and more importantly it was a solid body guitar like like les paul had kind of cracked that code that fender as far as i know was still working on because this is 1940 right yeah this was pre uh yeah early 1940 i think it was pre leo fender for sure yeah so i mean les paul really does have a claim to fame to creating the first wooden solid body electric guitar because i think the frying pan was solid body aluminum but it, he, he figured out that problem of reverb just get rid of the hollow body replace it with the solid body and it was ugly that seems to be the big problem it wasn't exactly what he was looking for sound wise but it was definitely close enough that he was like i'm on the right track let me go show the people at gibson they're gonna love this kind of thing and um they basically laughed him out of the meeting in kalamazoo michigan because he um, showed up with a really ugly guitar. Yeah, and not only that, like, they just didn't see the vision uh, because, like I said, Clearly, they were working yeah. with these ancient luthiers who, who had this ancient craft. They weren't ancient humans, but... They would wake them from the dead <laughs> each day to, to go to the workshop and create a new guitar. Uh, but the point is they were doing great with these big acoustic guitars, and they were like, no one's going to want to hear that because this is what a guitar is, basically. Like, you don't... It's not a lead instrument in a band. Leave that to the horns and the piano. So he was laughed out of there and had a little egg on his face, but this was a full five years before Leo Fender came up with his first plank guitar, which you should also look up. Uh, Just type in Leo Fender black uh, plank guitar, and it looks a little more like a guitar than the log, but not that much. No, it looks more, way more like a guitar than the log. But it still doesn't look like a guitar as we know it. Yeah, it was almost, I get the impression that he created the guitar kind of like how you might build like a car out of clay, but the axle works because you're testing wheels. I don't think people uh, actually. And he do built that. it as a test. Yeah. But, I don't think we mentioned that though. Yeah, but it was, it was, a, he was testing out like pickups and I think testing the concept of a solid body as well. But he wasn't making it like, this is going to be my prototype. But it right. turned out to actually be kind of a prototype because um, when he, uh, w- I, I don't exactly know how word got around, I guess because he was friends with bands. So bands would kind of yeah. come around the workshop to see what was going on. And they started coming around seeing and hearing this guitar that he made. And um, people started renting it apparently for the weekend to go play shows with and just knocking the socks off of the Bobby Soxers in town from what I can tell. Yeah, and at this point, he has the the Fender Electric Instrument Company. Uh, it's legit. And, you know, in the background of all of this, and we're not going to talk much about amps, but in the background of all of this, he's building amps along the way. He was one of the first sort of master amp builders. Well, yeah, Fender amps are like as famous as the guitar, basically. Yeah. So, Don't want to shortchange those. So where are we at right now? Fender's made his plank guitar. Leo's got his log. Neither one of them are going places immediately with it. It's just kind of like they've both now cracked the problem, and and there's a lot of obstacles between them and fame, or at least guitar production fame. Um, but you know what that means, though, right? What? We're at our second break. Oh, good. Okay, Chuck. I think that was great. Um, so Chuck just said we're at our second break. He's clearly driving this episode. Let's all go with it, shall we?
Okay, we're back, Chuck. <laughs> we're back. We got a log. We've got this little funny looking black solid body guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, we need to pick back up with, with Les Paul in 19, I guess, 41 ish. Mm-hmm. He moves to Los Angeles. He's starting to get session work. Uh, he plays with Bing Crosby, who was uh, sort of one of the most popular singers at the time. Oh, yeah. Dude, he moved to Los Angeles to be near Bing Crosby, which I did a little research, and that was kind of a common thing. What, to just want to be near Bing Crosby? <laughs> yeah, you move across the country to be near Bing Crosby. Unless you were one of his kids. Oh, was he not He's, a good father? No. Oh, really? Not a good dad. I didn't know that. Wait yeah, a minute. But, Are you thinking of Mommy Dearest? No, oh yeah, that's right. That's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> thinking of Joan Crawford. Uh, but he was a huge, huge music star. Um, Les Paul was out there working with him, but then he gets, uh, I don't think we mentioned, he got electrocuted really bad when he was 26. Oh yeah, that's a um, big one. Playing music, he had sweaty hands, held the microphone, was also touching the guitar strings, completed a circuit and really damaged his hand such that it took, uh, I mean, it hurt his whole body, but it damaged his hand such that it took quite a, couple of years to even recover Mm -hmm. which is huge like he he might have never played again like there was a possibility that was going to happen yeah and that's just injury number one for him right um but he gets drafted in world war ii uh goes to work in the army at the armed forces radio network and is playing guitar basically backing up the andrew sisters uh backing up bing crosby when they do these uso tours so as far as the army goes in world war ii pretty plum gig Right. Um, so, and plus he's, again, like he did move to LA to be near Bing Crosby. And the fact that he's getting to like play with Bing Crosby is, I, I'm guessing a lifelong dream of his come true. Um, and even after the war, I guess he made enough of a connection with Bing. Um, I'm on a first name basis with him, by the way. Sure. Um, he, uh, that, that Les Paul, um, kind of, I guess, became, I don't know if there was like a mentor thing, but at the very least, he definitely patronized Les Paul, helped his career big time. One of the things that really helped Les Paul become like a genuine bona fide star, he was already fairly well known in a lot of circles, had some hits, but what really shot him to the top was a 1945 song called It's Been a Long, Long Time. It's actually a really good song, but it was kind of a a song that was a hit because it kind of summed up America trudging wearily back from World War II. Um, and it's just kind of like this mellow, solemn song where uh, it's almost, I'm sure there's other instruments, but my ears pick up Bing Crosby's vocals and Les Paul's jazz guitar. Um, yeah. And they it, it his guitar enhances the vocals so much. But there's an actual guitar solo in there. And it's slow, but it's really good. And that kind of shot Les Paul to superstardom from that point on. Yeah, so Bing Crosby is like, you need to open up a a studio. I'll even help finance this thing. He did so in his garage. And before you know it, in uh, Los Angeles, all these famous people are stopping by Les Paul's garage to hear him play, to hang out with him. Uh, Like I said, he was a very gregarious guy. So people just kind of wanted to be around him. And this is all going great. uh, But he still wasn't quite satisfied with what was going on because the sound – just still wasn't there. Uh, he was, he it, he called it sound on sound recording. He was the first person, mm, this is uh, huge, or one of the first people to experiment with studio techniques, where you could layer uh, recordings on top of one another. And this was before <laughs> they were even recording on magnetic tape. Yeah, dude, multi-track recording. Like you know how you hear drums playing and you hear a guitar playing and then you hear like vocals. All of those musicians may never have even been in the same room at the same time. You can do that with multi-track recording. Back in the day, if you wanted to make a recording, you had to get everybody into a room. You all had to be playing at once. You had to be playing the song together, and then you recorded it, and that was the recording, right? So to come up with multi-track recording was huge in and of itself. But I looked into what he was actually doing, and it's mind-boggling. He he came up, I think, with a song called Lover, and it was... Was that the one where it's like seven tracks or eight tracks of of guitar? I think so, yeah. And the way that he made each track was he recorded one track, the first initial track, onto acetate. He made a record of that. And then he took that record and he played it. And then he played along with it. And then he recorded that onto another record. And then another record. And then another record. And by the time he was doing his seventh track, 
he had a record of seven that of seven tracks playing all at once on one record that he had recorded one by one and he was playing the eighth track with it and if he messed Amazing. up one time say on track yeah. five he had to start all over at the beginning unless he still had those first few tracks handy uh hopefully he didn't break each record after each recording or anything like that but in that nuts going to that and that was about as innovating uh, a form of music as anyone had come up with to that point yeah it's funny when you hear people working with like pro tools and drag and drop digital recording now and they talk about like in the old days when they use when they would cut and splice tape (laughs) like go back even further dude yeah (laughs) to les paul doing this on actual Actual acetate records. It's crazy. It is crazy. When I I was like, what what does that mean? What was he doing? Like dueling acetate records? And I looked and I my eyes popped out of my head. Yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable the innovations he was coming up with. So he's doing all that. He's uh, becoming more and more popular. And then a very faithful thing happened. Uh, a steel guitar player named uh, Do we say Joaquin Murphy? That's what I'm going with. All right, that's how it's spelled. Uh, he came over to Les's house one day. And he said, you know what? I got this guy here. Uh, I want you to meet him. And he's really good with working on amplifiers. And I think you guys might like each other. Uh, and his name is Leo Fender. And Wait, before you what? know it, and this this is movie territory, Leo Fender and Les Paul are hanging out together, mm-hmm. trying to figure stuff out together, mm-hmm. workshopping, problem solving. They, um, you know, they pointed out, and he's right, that they weren't like, great friends but it's not like they were enemies or rivals at first they just were really really different from each other yeah um they kind of shared a uh, at the very least they had a common problem or a common quest that they were both working on they were just not similar people personality wise so they didn't click yeah you put it they weren't like this is great let's be partners we're the same right exactly but they also were also kind of becoming rivals a little bit too right well, not quite yet. Like at this point, they were genuinely c- trying to figure stuff out together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think like Leo was coming over every weekend, basically. Uh, musicians would come over still and he would ask them questions and try and figure stuff out, mm-hmm. try and solve these amplification problems. But um, yeah, there may have been a little, little friendly like let's see what this guy's got kind of thing. But, you know, Les Paul was like, you can't even play. Dude. Yeah. And again, remember, <laughs> remember though, Fender, by this time, he had a, a company, the Fender Electric Instrument Company. He was mostly focusing on uh, electric steel guitars because um, not just country western love that stuff, but Hawaiian music was really huge as well. Um, and they use a lap steel guitar. So yeah. um, he was he had a company already going. Les Paul had his own musical career going. He was just kind of, you know, he tinkered because he needed to. His, his focus is on his musical career. So I could see there being like a little bit of a rivalry in that they were trying to crack the same problem. But other than that, they weren't necessarily rivals, you know? That's right. Uh, and in order to really solve this problem, it would take the entrance of a third gentleman that we haven't even mentioned yet. Uh-huh. That was very, very important to the story of the electric guitar. And that is where we're going to leave you for part one. Nice, Chuck. That was a very good cliffhanger. Who could it be? I don't know, but you're going to have to tune in Thursday to find out in this very special two-part episode of (laughs) Stuff You Should Know. My money's on C.C. DeVille. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.